So now this past week, an article came out in Nature website entitled Caught in the Act, written by Maggie McGee. The article acknowledges several of the very real problems evolutionary theory has in explaining various features found in our solar system. Good morning, Ian. While mining that Nature article for whatever can be twisted to support your delusion, you seem to have totally missed that it actually deals with planetary science. The Jovian moon Io, Saturn's rings and its moons Enceladus and Titan do not experience change in allele frequencies over time. You know, Ian, playing the smart outdoorsy type with the Mensa card, the Rockhammer and the Beige Adventure Wear might convince your inane audience that evolutionary theory should explain planetary motion. But to the rest of us, your tragic irony smells more reminiscent of the Orgian's tables. In other words, it's utter horseshit. For example, physicist Wayne Spencer had been pointing out the problems that Jupiter's moon Io presents to deep time because of the ridiculous amount of heat the moon is pumping out. Now, obviously, an object can only put out heat for so long before it cools down. So therefore, the moon cannot be billions of years old. Now, Spencer had been pointing this out for decades and published the math on it in his 2003 ICC paper, which you can read here. Well, when it comes to pumping out ridiculous amounts, Io is easily dwarfed by the amount of hot air that has gone into inflating the credibility of Wayne's paper. You know, liberally sprinkling your nonsense with sciencey sounding terminology lends just as little credence to it as flashing your Mensa card or dressing up as Indiana Jones and exploring the art of stonemasonry in Glen Rose, Texas. But enough of the pleasantries. Tidal Dissipation and the Age of Io was published in 2003 and according to your fervent proclamation provides all the math. So let's not waste any more time and take a closer look at that scientific leviathan you have mustered to your cause. A skim through the 11-page TPS report reveals a sum total of three equations, two of which are trivial. And while equation 2 that describes the ratio of the mean motions of Io, Europa and Ganymede is actually relevant, it is more a formality than a redeeming feature. Apparently, your pal Wayne didn't consider it at all necessary to include any formal discussion of tidal dissipation in his similarly titled magnum opus. Rest assured that I will point out one or two inaccuracies in this collection of unilluminating drivel, but not before arming my audience with the basic physics of tidal heating. If you have ever wondered why there is never any miscommunication of tides coming in and going out, you should pay close attention. First, we need to derive the tidal potential that is an effect of the gravitational potential. For a celestial body, in our case Io, orbiting another one, here consequently Jupiter, the latter is determined by Newton's law of gravity. R denotes the distance between the respective centers of mass and M the mass of Jupiter. G is the gravitational constant. Let us now consider a particle on Io's surface. At the near side, it experiences a slightly stronger gravitational potential due to the relative proximity to Jupiter, and by extension the potential is weaker at the far side. Mathematically, we can account for this difference by replacing r with the total distance that is obtained by the law of cosines for r and the respective position of the particle, small r. Next, we expand the potential as a Legendre polynomial, which results in this expression. Because the orbital radius is a lot bigger than that of the moon, r divided by capital R is a very small value. So small in fact that we can ignore all terms with that fraction to the power of 3 or greater. So far we have only considered the gravitational potential. However, 
a planetary orbit is characterized by an equilibrium of centrifugal and gravitational forces. For the center of mass, the net force is therefore zero. Yet for a particle on the surface, those forces differ slightly. This difference is the tidal force that results in the tidal potential. It turns out that the potential that results from centrifugal forces matches the first two terms in the gravitational potential. The remaining equation is the tidal potential we wanted to derive. Applying the choice of numerical computation illustrates that the tidal potential has its biggest magnitude at the far and the near side of Io. Yet more importantly, the potential is inversely proportional to the cube of the distance to Jupiter. Io completes her slightly elliptical orbit in only 1.77 days, which results in a maximum tidal amplitude of 100 meters. That's a tidal bulge of 100 meters in rock. Unsurprisingly, the resulting friction creates a lot of heat. Heat is a form of energy, often called a dissipative energy, since it is otherwise lost from the system. To quantify the amount of tidal dissipation that results from a 100 meter tide about four times a week, we start with power. Power is the rate of energy dissipation and defined as force times velocity. The force can be expressed as the negative gradient of the tidal potential times the mass. Further, the mass can be written as density rho times the integral over the volume of Io. Simply put, this integral adds up all the individual tidal forces on all the infinitesimal volumes times the individual rates of movement. Should you feel the fervent desire to solve this integral yourself, you are encouraged to look up my references. I will limit my remarks to presenting the solution. In the equation, K2 represents Io's rigidity, N is the orbital mean motion, and E stands for the orbital eccentricity. Q is the effective tidal dissipation parameter, and inversely proportional to the change of mean motion. Now, before I present numbers, let's quickly read why Wayne thinks that Io is a special creation. But from observations of Io, any change in Io's orbit seems to be too small to measure. This is shown by results published by Liesky. This study examines a large amount of data, including 16,000 eclipse observations from 1652 to 1983. Their published value for the rate of change of the mean motion of Io is minus 0.74 plus or minus 0.87 times 10 to the power of minus 11 per year. They suggest that Io is slowly evolving out from Jupiter and out of resonance with time. But when the uncertainty is greater than the measured change, how can this be a proper conclusion? I will take the view that this result indicates Io's orbit is stable and exhibits no secular change. Sounds plausible, doesn't it? Well, let me summarize the procedure. Your pal quote mined a number from the scientific literature that was published in 1987. This regarded every single publication since then and concluded the exact opposite of the source. And on top of that, he referred to the sole author as they. Given the mathematical infidelity, the efforts in contextomy and the absence of any actual argument, I will take the view that his assertion was derived solely from rectal reasoning. Just a superficial glance over Liesky's paper reveals that his is not the only measurement regarding change in the mean motion of Io. If we account for these higher secular accelerations, the aforementioned equation yields a total tidal dissipation in the order of 10 to the power of 14 watts. Rather inconveniently for your creationist endeavors, this coincides well with the observed infrared heat flow from Io. Now, before you employ your superhuman number puzzle solving abilities in a misguided linear extrapolation and determine that Io would have stood still 2 billion years ago and that therefore the universe must have been spoken into existence by the invisible wizard in the sky, let me briefly mention some of Io's orbital characteristics. Io, Europa and Ganymede are in a 4 to 2 to 1 orbital resonance. Every time Io gets close to Europa or Ganymede, it gets a slight tug, forcing an eccentricity of its orbit. 
This eccentricity in turn allows for tidal dissipation. And like our Moon does from Earth, Io also receives a tidal torque from Jupiter that replenishes the dissipated energy. An accelerating mean motion implies that Io is currently migrating inward. As it does so, its eccentricity and therefore also the heat dissipation will decrease. Eventually, the tidal torque from Jupiter may reverse the inward migration of Io, which will then migrate outward until the dissipation again wins over the torque and the satellite resumes inward migration. And hence, Io would experience episodic heating and cooling, and it seems that we have been fortunate enough to witness a period where she is exceptionally hot. Of course, the subjective peculiarity of such a spectacle happening right before our eyes did not escape your biblical glasses. And based on the profound method of parroting that nature article, you concluded that it is statistically unlikely to have happened by natural means. And you see, statistically, it is highly unlikely that your parents, your grandparents and everyone before them procreated just in the right order to give rise to you. But here you are, claiming that evolutionary models fail to fit the facts. We all know that you are not arguing against evolution, but your very own version of it. And your preferred explanation, at least in this case, constitutes nothing more than a copy-pasted collection of selective citations, baseless assertions and the invocation of the celestial knob twiddler in every second paragraph. Well, I guess our paths will cross again. That is, of course, if you haven't proved that your existence is too improbable after all, and vanished in a puff of logic.